sitting uh, another few hundred miles away monitoring all of this. And I apologize to everyone for the late notice on this. Um, it's long overdue. And it's taken us this long to put the technology together. And we wanted to do it in such a way so that if we messed it up, it would be in front of our best friends. So you would all have a lot of forgiveness for us. Um, all right. Hey, guys, you can hear me. Hold on one second. Yep. Anna is saying she's got no audio. I don't know if anybody right. else out there is feeling the same. So we're going to we're going to live. We have shoot one right person now. telling us they have no audio. So we're going to do a line check right now. At least we didn't start out with testing one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing audio is working now. So let's continue, right. gentlemen. Thank let's you. Let's try that again. Let's try yes. that again. Okay. So this is an interactive situation. And if it works out at some degree uh, and we get all the buttons pushed correctly and everything holds together, some of what we do tonight is very likely to appear on the Public Square radio program. Uh, we're going to talk for about an hour. And the purpose of the conversation is to bring everybody up to speed as best we can on what's going on with the whole COVID-19 crisis and what our policy uh, impact is and how we're doing that and what's being made. So um, we've approached this prayerfully before we started tonight. We, we took time to pray. Uh, I would say that we've been praying more for our country than maybe ever before. Uh, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been sleeping less since January than ever before. It's taken us a phenomenal amount of hours to read into this. And for those of you that are brand new with the work of the roundtable, we established this operation in, uh, in 1980 as a public policy organization that has grown into a media education and research organization that focuses in public policy. And our goal is to bring the first principles of the Declaration, the Constitution, to, into the play of what's happening on our daily lives in, in the field of public policy. So uh, we got highly engaged in healthcare in the 1990s particularly in the Clinton Health Security Act. And if we were in our other offices, um, I would have lots of books to show you of the Health Security Act and Obamacare and all those things that we have read time and time and time again. I, I can I can grab those. I have those oh, close have by those before the end of the evening. Yes, office. I do. We'll let that, all right, we might, we might yet bring those out. But fundamentally what we're talking about here with COVID-19 is a question of health care and public law, and in particular, we're talking about quarantine law. So the purpose of tonight is to give you a quick up, update on where we are. And then I want to focus in on the conversation that recently was held between uh, uh, Governor Cuomo and MSNBC regarding what's happening with the presidential tax, task force and where we go forward from here. So since many of you are already up to speed with what we're doing, because you've been listening to the COVID Chronicles series on the public square, which is now up to, I think, eight episodes, which you can find them at thepublicsquare.com. I won't take the time to drag us all through what we've been through together. Uh, you'll pick up our drift on how we deal with this as we go forward. But let me give you this summary on where we are to date. Nobody saw COVID-19 coming. The people who were the best at this, the epidemiologists and the docs, they knew the potential was there for something like this to happen. Uh, and if you've had any affection for um, zombie apocalypse movies or uh, movies that talk about, you know, the blob that ate Cleveland or the end of the world or whatever that stuff is, the threat's always been out there that something would come and get us. Well, we all know the history of how this happened coming out of China and how it got here in the early days. But in essence, there was no time frame for everybody to warm up to this thing. We got hit, all of us, we all got hit by it. So what happened was the states got scared quick and and they should have been scared quick because what happened was the CDC and the federal government's the federal government provided the scientific track those now infamous models model 1 model 2 model 3 model 4 we've seen them all they all came out they were hot models they were creepy scary models and everybody got scared including all the governors what they got scared the most of is that they were going to be overwhelmed in their hospital systems and not going to be able to, to, to deal with this, and that the states would be competitors against one another. So they went to the federal government and said, hey, we got to do this together. The federal government listened to that. And, and here's the way the deal shook down. The CDC took care of the science and the protocols. CDC was going to go and get up all the, 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 the models so you'd have a look at what's going to happen to you, and then we'll tell you what we think you ought to do. But the states would be responsible for doing it, the shutdowns and all that sort of stuff the shutdowns, the lockdowns, and all those protocols. 
in exchange, if you will, this task force working with the governors, the president and the task force would take on the burden of making sure that the logistics and the supply lines were there so that the hospitals wouldn't get overwhelmed. So that it makes sense. That's, that was the progress. And as the states went out and did the shutdown protocols recommended by the federal government, Donald Trump and the Congress would spot the states a few trillion dollars, uh, trending up towards four trillion now to cover things like small business loans, unemployment checks, stimulus bills, bailouts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the early jingle was we're all in this together because that's the way the deal went down. Well, we started to do the math on the models because as the shutdowns grew from suggestions to mandatory to lockdowns, then to lockouts, and we realized all of this was predicated upon science. There was another track of data coming along at the same time, and that was the actual real numbers of what was happening in the world with COVID-19. And those two numbers are very disparate. They're very far away. So a lot of people pulled out the old paper and pencil, okay? Right here, I got a whole notebook full of notes. Rob does too, Alan does too. Pages and pages of notes where we started banging together the story problem of what this really looks like, and then talking to professionals in the field. And when and when we did those, Dave, being the teacher, made us show us our work. So there we are. Our kids are at home doing their schoolwork. We have everything laid out on desks at home, and we have to send emails with our work. He wanted, he didn't want us using iPhones to get to the answer. He wanted to see work. And then we took pictures of the work, and we put it together, and we sent it out to people who were genuinely qualified to be able to put this together for us. And they certified that our math was in the neighborhood. And this was somewhere between the third and the fourth models that we saw presented. We realized we had a problem, a very serious problem. And so we began to look at these models and realize that the uh, when the president said that the cure could be worse than the, than the actual virus, we knew for a fact that was going to happen. And so at that stage in the game, we began sounding the alarm about the models. And in some ways, we helped crack the code on those models. Now, I'm not looking for credit. There was a lot of people that were doing that and have done it, and they've had bigger microphones than we have. But we've been working on cracking the code on the model. So that's been one of the things that we did. And then very quickly, we went to the legislature uh, in, in what we thought was the key state, and that's Ohio, not because our headquarters there, but because there's two pivotal states. Well, actually, there's three really pivotal states right now, maybe four. Uh, the first being New York because of the crisis there uh, and the size and the scope of that. That's not surprising. New York is always the worst place to, for the flu every single year. Look at the flu stats for the last 10 years. That's not a surprise. Uh, then we knew that Ohio was going to be pivotal because Mike DeWine really got into this thing and decided he was going to take it on and be a giant leader in the process. He made one of the first moves. Ohio was supposed to host the Arnold Classic, which they do every year in Columbus, the first or second weekend in March. And that has visitors, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world that come in. And he made the decision early on is they eliminated visitors from being able to come in on the convention center floor and go through where all the booths are. People will be close together buying, spending. They, they, they kept everyone away from that. And what we saw very quickly in analyzing the actual crisis on the ground, but then looking at the legal underpinnings of this, we started to ask those key leadership questions that we've been taught over the years, which is how do you define reality? You ask questions like, what is this? Well, this just isn't, is, isn't a health crisis. It's also a crisis that has to do with what does the law say? And how do you deal with these laws appropriately? So we began to work on that side of it. And very quickly, we recognized that just like the models were very far away from reality, the model said one thing, but on the ground, it was like this. This whole idea that the president could shut down the country, um, not so much. You see, they had a good deal set together. But the deal was based on an agreement, not based upon the law, because the federal government has very limited powers in a quarantine situation, very limited powers. The states have almost all the legal authority and all the court precedent. And then here's something else that we got to, and I don't want to forget this before we close tonight, is that we've been through this before. Quarantine laws intersect with civil liberties in a very messy way. It's, it's bad. 
I mean, wh- when we get into these situations and people start shutting people down and, and, and calling the cops on other people and wearing masks and all this stuff and shutting down businesses, this is never pretty. And it's happened before multiple times in America. The problem is after Americans go through it, after they're scarred by it, and it's, it's a big scar and it hurts, people, they don't learn from that scar. They don't press into that scar. They run away from the scar. The scare becomes the scar. The scar is what we run away from. And then we never fix the laws. So the next time that it happens, we're just as susceptible to the chaos and then to strong people rising up and having little dictatorial fiefdoms. And we got a mess on our hands. Well, Dave, you mentioned the quarantine laws and the isolation laws. And what we've realized across the country is those laws, I think a lot of folks assume that those rested with the governor or General Assembly, state legislatures across the country. But what we're finding out where the power comes from when it comes to those laws are health departments, both local, county, state level. So this is some of the rationale that went behind our first news release of March 23rd, in which we uh, called upon the General Assembly to wake up and stop this abuse of law, particularly to fix the election that Mike DeWine in Ohio blew up because he just blew it up. He was really derelict in duty. He just didn't get his job done. They waited to the last minute. They had weeks. They could have moved the election. They didn't call upon the General Assembly. And then by fiat, they just went with their with their state quarantine power and said that applies to an election. That's never happened before in the United States. But even worse, it happened a second time in Wisconsin. Same formula. So you had a Republican governor doing it in Ohio and a Democrat governor doing it in Wisconsin. That's when we began to realize if the legislature doesn't get involved, we could lose an election in November. And I mean lose an election. I mean the election just get hung up in all kinds of terrible legal litigation because it's not done correctly because of all the bouncing around off of COVID. Okay, so that's some of the background. And then what we want to do is we want to spend some time answering your questions and also showing you that we do have a pathway out of this thing. Now, I'll tell you in advance, the pathway out of this you're not going to (laughs) like, you are not going to like this. I don't like this. I really don't like life right now because I can tell you the world we woke up to in January 1st and all the plans that we had for this year have been completely blown to smithereens. And I'm not real thrilled about it. And I bet you're not either. And the way we fix this isn't exactly easy and it's not going to be fast, but I think we got it right. I think we know where to start. I think we know how to do it so that we can fix this so that our kids and our grandkids don't have to go through this again. And maybe, just maybe, we can gain a lot back once trust is restored. That's one of the first questions everybody's been asking. Do you think we can get it back? Well, maybe if we repent, maybe if we humble ourselves before the Lord, and maybe if we find a way to start telling the truth again to one another in the political circles and in the media circles, I heard I heard a whole bunch of people just laugh out loud when I said that. At least, at least if we can tell the truth to one another and work toward truthful objectives, maybe we can get trust restored. So let's take now this quote from uh, Governor Cuomo that just happened, I think, last night or the night before. It might have been last night. And I want to play that. And you can hear how what we set up for now applies to the dynamic that we're in right now. Rob, do you want to add any more before we go? I just wanted to say the people have been sending in questions all day and you can continue to send in questions. I'm monitoring them and we'll get them out. But probably this quote from Governor Cuomo, this dialogue that leads into probably the most popular question that we've received today dealing with uh, the presidential authority and what the governors have to say and how does that clash and how will they work together? As brutal as this has been, Uh, It does seem like the virus is no longer running away from us like it was just a few weeks ago. And New York Governor Andrew Cuomo joins me now on the phone. Thank you for making a little time, Governor. Um, Talk to me more about that sort of threading the needle between talking about the fact that, that, that certain key indicators are coming down. It looks like maybe we've passed the peak and not wanting to kind of take your foot off the gas, as it were, in the in the battle against the virus. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and uh, good evening for you. And thank you for your reporting uh, on this story. You've done a a tremendous service to us all. Uh, 
Look, the the reduction in the curve, if you will, the reduction on the projections is not an act of God. It's an act of government, and it's an act of the citizens of this country. We have reduced the curve. Uh, in New York, we think we hit a plateau, which is a horrific plateau with much, much pain and death. But that was done, and the numbers are so much different than the initial projections, because we acted responsibly and diligently. Uh, that's what is reducing the number. As soon as we stop doing what we're doing, if we get sloppy or undisciplined or we change track, you will see that number go up. You tell me the behavior of New Yorkers today, I'll tell you the hospitalization rate in four days. Uh, so, yes, we have reduced the curve. Uh, and because of our actions. And that's why we have to be very, very careful now as we get impatient and we want to reopen and we want to get out of the homes and we need to get back to work. We do that too fast. We do that without respecting science and data. You will see us boomerang and you'll see the no those numbers go up again. Uh, you know, the, the, the president uh, has taken a strange approach uh, in many ways, but there were a lot of people touting the kind of federalism uh, on display, which is to say a lack of a national guidelines for a while, allowing states to go. Then today he seemed to do a 180 and basically said, no, 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 it's not really up to the states when to quote unquote reopen, which itself is unclear. That's it's not a ribbon cutting, right? Um, he, he had this to say uh, at the press conference. I wanted to get your response to it about his authority in this matter. Take a listen. The President of the United States has the authority to do what the President has the authority to do, which is very powerful. The President of the United States calls the shots. They can't do anything without the approval of the President of the United <laughs> States. Is that true? Is that your understanding of how this works? No, that is not true. I don't know why the president said it. I don't know why he would take us down this path, because it's the exact opposite of everything he's been trying to say, right? He did his opening video saying bipartisan. Here, you had me in the video and Democratic governors. He's bipartisan. Then he winds up saying, I have total authority, which is not true. It's not legal. It's a total abrogation of the Constitution. Uh, the Tenth Amendment specifically says powers to the states. Alexander Hamilton, all the founding fathers, talked about the power of the states uh, and how repugnant it would be for a federal head to uh, say that they have uh, eminent authority. The Constitution says we don't have a king. To say I have total authority over the country because I'm the president, it's absolute. That is a king. We didn't have a king. We didn't have King George Washington. We had President George Washington. Uh, and why he would want to say that after initially, when he did the quote-unquote close down of the government, he never did the close down. He wants to say the travel ban with China was a close down. It wasn't. It was a travel ban with China. The close down was left to the governors to do individually, state by state. We have a whole quilt of different close down strategies because you left it to the governors. Now the, the reopen should be total authority after we just talked about well, bipartisanship. That makes no sense. Well, it seems to me that the, the, the sort of nightmare scenario from a policy perspective, to go back to what you said in the first uh, answer, is um, some sort of edict from the White House that everybody's got to open back up when that would be dangerous from a public health perspective, although it's also unclear whether that would be in any way enforceable other than just messaging. Well, yeah, it would be, look, if he said, uh, if he tried an edict from the White House that put the people of the state of New York in jeopardy or violated uh, what I thought was in their best interest from a public health point of view, we would just be off to a lawsuit. And that's the only way this really horrendous situation could get worse is if you now see a war between the federal government and the states. And why right. he would even go there, I have no idea. Let me let me ask you a final question uh, about because this 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 sort of relates in a in a sort of microcosm to the state of New York. Obviously, you have federal relationships and then you have relationships with local 
you know, mayors and county executives. There was a back and forth about school closures, which seemed to kind of reinscribe some of the tensions here between states and the federal government, which is the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, said that schools uh, would, would be closed throughout the rest of the year. Your office, and I think you yourself said he doesn't have that authority, leaving New York City school parents like myself somewhat frustrated and confused. What, what, what is going on there? Are, what is the clear legal authority you have, and how do you work out these sort of turf issues in the midst of this? Uh, look, the short answer is you don't. Uh, state does an emergency order. I have 700 school districts in my state. Uh, I had different school districts having different policies all across the state. It's an unmanageable situation. I get that local officials. I have 400 mayors. I have 62 county executives. Uh, I understand every local official wants uh, uh, power over their jurisdiction, and normally they have it. In an emergency situation, uh, you need a state policy that unifies the state. Uh, we went even further. I want New York State to work with Connecticut, work with Jersey, New Jersey, right. Massachusetts, to try to have a regional policy. But you can't have 700 school districts making 700 decisions. I closed the school statewide by a state emergency order. I rationalized the entire education system in the state. I closed down businesses, businesses in the state by one statewide closed down policy. And you can't have local governments in the state making their own decisions. It just wouldn't work. All right, Governor Andrew Cuomo, uh, thank you for taking a little bit of time with us tonight. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, one of the things I like about that is that he makes it pretty plain, doesn't he, what his opinion is. He well, has let me to say, give you this one. as, the, as the governor, he, he's not going to, he doesn't want to be bullied and told what to do. If he, this is a quote, if he tried an edict from the White House that put the people of the state of New York in jeopardy or violated what I thought was in their best interest from a public health point of view, we would just be off to a lawsuit. And that's the only way this really horrendous situation could get worse if, is if you now see a war between the federal government and the states. I can remember in the public policy business after 40 years of doing this, that there was a time when you were not supposed to use that kind of illustration. There were certain things you didn't talk about. You didn't construct with that kind of illustration. One being a civil war. Now this is the governor of the most critical state in this crisis saying, well, you know, maybe it's a war between us and the federal government. Well, really? That's sure a long way from where New York was six weeks ago, isn't it? Knowing that the chance of being completely overwhelmed by this thing was such that they needed all the help they can get, and they were going to pick a fight with anybody. Now, the first wave of the crisis seems to be sustainable, horrible, but sustainable. And now, all of a sudden, the governor's going, I got an idea. Maybe this is my call now, since I got what I needed, and I don't need any more, and all the power of the law is on my hands. But it's not just Cuomo. It's DeWine. It's Lee of Tennessee. Uh, it could, could become DeSantis of Florida. And, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that what the deals were set inside, there was a clear deal made. And it was quite an artful deal that got made that started this thing off and brought all these things. But now the deal is falling apart. And that's what everybody needs to understand. The president could stand up tonight and say, we're reopening the country tomorrow. And the governors yawn and say, I'll get back to you on that. After we go read the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, and a lot of the focus has been, Dave, on New York, New Jersey, because they have over half the deaths that have happened because of COVID-19 all across the country. They account for over 50 percent. So obviously there's been much more focus there than anywhere else. Yeah, so we've got to be aware that just what we're seeing on, um, you know, on the news and the news conferences, this isn't necessarily so. It's now, what does the law say? It's always been, what does the law say? But now, um, and I know that we've got members of the media <laughs> watching this. They were invited, uh, and they're on our list, so they get into the invite list. Uh, I, I, I'm so tempted to draw out great illustrations between uh, Governor Cuomo and the Confederacy. 
it's it's just remarkable after all these years that the state of New York has discovered states' rights. But that's the argument that's being made and covered for at MSNBC and the other major networks. So that's where we stand. So what is going to happen from here? I, 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 the president certainly has an influence and the CDC has an influence, but let's make sure we understand something. The power of the law is on the side of the states and the governors can do what they want. And the president says, you know, the president, uh, this is the law. And it goes back all the way back to the colonial period. For you start with the 10th Amendment, you go forward to all the other crises that we've had of healthcare situations. This is what's happening. So, so what are the states likely to do? Are we likely to get the economy open again? Um, beats the heck out of me. Rob, have you figured it out yet? No, not yet. And we, we've tried. Um, what has been interesting to see, though, is when all this started and the discussion began, the comment that was heard the most or the phrase that was heard the most was flatten the curve. The goal was to flatten the curve. So we've seen that curve be flattened beyond imagination in most places all across the country. Well, now that's happened. So there's been people talking, saying, hey, can we get the economy open? Can we get back to normal? We understand there are some people with some compromised immune systems. We understand a certain age group is being hit by this. But could could we get out and function in society? Because we know the hospitals are not going to be overrun. One thing we're seeing across the country is hospital workers, doctors being furloughed. We're seeing empty hospitals happen. But now, instead of just flattening the curve, because we don't want to overwhelm hospitals, now it's moved beyond that. And now the discussion is be how far can we take this out? It seems like they forgot what the original goal was, was just not to overwhelm the hospitals. But now it's gone much more deep than that. Okay. Questions that are coming in. Uh, quick question. Um, the magical drug that uh, President uh, Trump keeps talking about, hydroxychloroquine, and with all of the z pack and the zincs and all of that stuff, that particular drug, uh, why is it, uh, I've been asked, why isn't that everyone isn't talking about this drug, that it isn't being seen as the cure, why isn't it being used more often, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's pretty simple. Uh, when you roll out a drug that has the potential of a cure, uh, you want to be sure that you don't overpromise and underdeliver. Now, it's clear because of the use of this drug for many years that the question of side effects, according to our, our friend, Dr. Chuck McGowan, McGowan that the side effects issue isn't really a substantive issue. People aren't going to die taking this drug uh, because of the drug, because of the side effects. So the question is how effective it will it be. The problem, of course, is if the drug is not being heralded in its value because it came through the disclosure port of entry was Donald Trump. And as you can see from yesterday's news conference, the media is not going to give Donald Trump credit for anything. So the fact that Donald Trump was the one that recommended it and, and the people of Fox News were the ones that were promoting it the most means it's most likely not going to ever get heralded for its actual value. I think that's one of the things that's been interesting to talk about. And again, this isn't a time to defend the president, to attack the president, whatever. It's to, to provide facts and to put it out there. But it's been interesting to me is the people – during this term that have called Donald Trump a dictator and a fascist are now screaming at him because he hasn't been a dictator and a fascist in his actions and telling people what to do and how to do it. It's like what he was accused of. Now they're upset that he didn't take uh, those actions and tell people exactly what to do and how to do it all over. I, I, the hypocrisy that comes in the political game sometimes is overwhelming. Another question that's come up is how does all of this going on in the numbers rate uh, to the uh, flu, to the traditional flu? Right now, we are way below flu numbers across the country. Uh, this virus isn't even remotely close to what the flu did in 2018, 2017 in regards to hospitalizations and deaths and actual infections. I think it was 18 that we had 45 million cases of the flu with 60,000 people passing away. We're nowhere near those numbers. Uh, and that's important to understand. We get yelled at for comparing this to the flu. But I want to repeat for those of you that haven't had a chance to listen to the COVID Chronicles on the public square. There is right now, and what we I think we have it referenced on our site uh, in the COVID Chronicles, the Johns Hopkins University uh, webinar that was done where their chief virologist four times in four minutes described COVID-19 as a mild disease with mild symptoms 
for most people. 98% of the people who get this recover. Many of the people who get this do not have a terrible run with this outside of what you would expect from a significant upper respiratory flu. Now, some people get really, really sick and we are not, uh, we are not COVID deniers. We've been accused of being COVID idiots, which is one of my favorite terms now in this. I'm thinking about getting a t-shirt made up. Uh, yes, I am a COVID idiot, but, but the truth of the matter is the death rate is small. Now, it's still scary and it's still real. And it is a very significant threat to anyone who is aged and aged in this case means 65 or older. That's the number they're using. And it gets, it gets worse as you go up, but particularly people who are morbidly obese, diabetic, pre-diabetic, or have other comorbidities. I think we've all heard that enough to know it. Please know we get that. We're only saying it so you know, we know, and that this is deadly serious in that perspective and must be dealt with in that perspective. And that should be our highest priority. Dave, kind of a two-part question. It's coming from a number of folks. Um, one being, do you think uh, COVID-19 was here earlier in the flu season, in the winter, than we've talked about? And how does that roll into antibodies testing? And when a vaccine becomes available, the possibility of that vaccine being mandatory. So I guess that's like a three or four part question. Sure, and, and I'll ask a fifth one. And by the time the vaccine is ready, will it be relevant? See, people don't know that most flu vaccines are only 30 to 40% effective. We're always guessing with a vaccine. And, and we're studying in the flu vaccine, and, the Southern hemisphere and what happened the cycle before, and then just throwing it out there. And, and it's a guesstimate. Well, was it here earlier? Probably had to be. And I think what we're seeing is we're seeing people going back, doing blood testing and blood banks, finding uh, evidence that it was here earlier than that. And it is possible that some people have had it and, and don't even know that they've had it or have had they, they had it and thought it was something else. Well, I think it makes people nervous when they hear Dr. Fauci or in the state of Ohio um, elected officials talk about the thought of maybe getting tested or receiving a vaccine to re-enter society, almost like an immunization passport. You have permission to do things once you prove to us that you've been vaccinated or you've already had the virus. And this goes to the question we've had the most of. The single biggest question that keeps getting asked is when, 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 when are we going to be able to reopen the country, reopen the economy, go back to work? The, the short answer is when we, the people, convince the governors in the key states that we're not going to take it anymore. And I mean that. The quarantine laws are thin. One listener sent this question in. Tell us about Ohio 3701.13. This may be the thinnest, thinnest line of legal authority that's being abused right now. Ultimate After, authority. I'm sorry. Ultimate authority Ultimate is what authority. the law says. Yeah. After 9-11, the Ohio General Assembly made a change in the quarantine laws. The balance of the quarantine laws have been around since the 50s, and they're pretty creepy if you look them up. They say things like the Department of Health can come to your house, lock you in, and put signs up in front of your house saying this house is quarantined because, and you can't leave. There's laws like that still on the books, and they're still active from back in the 50s. Well, after 9-11, because of the fear of bioterrorism, like anthrax or other things happening. The Ohio General Assembly said, we need a rapid response provision for quarantine. So let's do this. Let's put the ultimate authority for quarantines in, into the hands of whoever is the director of the Ohio Department of Health. And so they wrote a thin line of code law in which they said, basically ultimate authority for quarantines belongs to the director of the Ohio Department of Health and so on and so forth. Everybody thought, okay, if there's a big emergency, that'll help us. And then they, just like they do with quarantine laws we've done since our beginning, everybody walks away and says, okay, let's get on to other things, much more important and things that are nicer to think about. Well, unfortunately, that thin line of code hit the fan in January of this year. And what ended up happening in Ohio, where they decided to create their own strategy based on their own models and to be the super shutdown state and the super lockdown state, and now the super everybody wears a mask state and all that stuff. They're picking who's essential and who's non-essential. They're picking the winners and the losers. 
All right. We've been through all of this. We've all seen it. We've all watched it. That hangs on a very thin little pad of law that's one sentence long. Well, that's stupid. Nobody should have that much power, particularly somebody that is a designated appointee of the state, of, of the governor and a member of the cabinet and not elected, therefore not answerable to the people. So one of the very first things we're proposing in quarantine reform, which we'll get to in the middle, is that law has got to change in every state that has anything like that, that has got too much power placed in bureaucracy and in non-elected officials, that power has got to come back to the General Assembly. Now, that's the long term issue of how we stay out of this and bounce back into it again. Let's say everything opens back up and then things get a little dicey next January. The recovery is happening, but the flu numbers start bumping up, COVID numbers, and they say, okay, we're going to start the shutdowns again. We can never again let them do this to us twice, let alone do it to our kids. And part of that's going to be restructuring law. But how do we get open now? The people of every state listening, and there are multiple states listening to this, have to begin to pursue their governors and their state lawmakers and say, we've had enough. You must stop this and bring balance back. We can do three things at one time. We can protect ourselves, protect the elderly and the hospital capacity and work. Uh, one person has commented to me, we have friends that have actually had factories in Italy, in some of the hotspots in Italy. Two factories come to mind in which not a single employee caught COVID this year until the government came and shut the plants down because they shut everything down. But the shutdown was not based upon a single infection. They were able to conduct business in Italy with manufacturing, with proper social distancing, and nobody got sick. It can be done. It's being done right now in states all over the place. Let's not kid ourselves. There's a whole lot of stuff that is still open and they're getting along pretty doggone well. And the numbers are are exponentially flatter. I mean, I've got Amy Atkins from Ohio. Her worst, or her her best case curve scenario right now, uh, and we've been tracking these numbers every single day. Based on her best curve numbers, Ohio should be at 47,000 cases right now, with the flattest curve she could imagine. Ohio's at 7,200 cases. She's off by 40,000 cases. That's on her fourth model. She's off on 40,000 cases, and in early March, she talked about 100,000 people being infected with the virus, and that was just a guess when only a few had tested positive. Dave, another question that keeps coming in, it's asked, um, there's some constitutional questions around the country. We can look at Colorado. A father was put in handcuffs for playing wiffle ball in the park with a six-year-old daughter. In Kentucky, you had people going to church warned. They didn't mention church warned of going to mass gatherings. They would track your license plate and you'd be visited. You can look in North Carolina where property owners are not permitted to go to their property during a time of emergency. You had people from Rhode Island um, that, well, Rhode Island was a state that went door to door with the National Guard, telling people from New York, giving them instructions on quarantine laws. It goes on and on. Rhode Island had golfers from Massachusetts arrested for crossing state lines. And the last one was uh, mentioned was 22 people in San Diego cited for being in their for gathering to watch a sunset. They were in their cars, all separate folks. So there's a lot of constitutional questions. I'll leave it with this and, and, and turn it over to you. The city of Raleigh today. The city of Raleigh today, there was a protest held in North Carolina and people were gathered. That protest was dispersed by the police and someone sent a uh, tweet to them and said, what did they do illegal? And the response from the Raleigh police on Twitter was the governor has deemed protests non-essential. So in essence, you're seeing constitutional violations all across the country. What do we say to that? Quarantine laws run headlong into the most treasured of American liberties. This is the history of quarantine laws because they're designed to stop you where you are or stop merchandise or stop property or stop activity. They're dangerous laws. That's why they're supposed to be very short lived. Our problem is we don't know how long this is going to last or how long the governors who now realize how much power they have question came up. Do you think the governors knew how much power they had when they started in this? Not a chance. I don't think they knew at all. And they didn't care about their power. They needed help. Once they got the help, then they got more interested in their power. That's that's human nature. These aren't wicked, evil people. The law's on their side. Unfortunately, so are a lot of court rulings on their side from way back. 
because the courts, the federal courts, tend to defer to the states based on the Tenth Amendment and based on the fact that they assume that the states know what they're doing. So, and this is an emergency situation, and it's not supposed to have permanent duration. However, we've never faced the situation that we have now with the electronic uh, ability to uh, sur of surveillance and tracking and testing. This is the next danger zone. I got to tell you right now, folks, I, I, the whole testing thing has been all over the place. They started off saying tests weren't that important. Then tests could be important. Then tests aren't important. Now they're important. Now tests are going to be your portal back into the workplace. Mandatory testing is a disastrous idea because of tracking. Those records are never going to disappear in this world. And you don't want to be in that position uh, where your privacy is vulnerable in a state of emergency. Would you, would you take it as far to say, too, as well as the mandatory vaccine, if they said you haven't had the virus, we're going to make you take the vaccine or you're not permitted to enter into society? See, now it's one thing to say you've got to take the vaccine. It's another thing to say you have to take the vaccine or else. Two different kinds of laws. Those things are going to end up in court. Now, I'm just, you know, you might say, well, OK, look, we were doing pretty well with this when it was suggestions. The problem happened when it began to become mandated and it became mandated because governors were listening to lab coat scientists who were giving them models that have proven to be untrue. But somehow the governors can't shake the fear or maybe they're just hooked on the power or maybe they're trapped by the media. I don't know why they can't get off this, but they're not going to get off of this until people come to them and say, we've had enough. I'm sorry, we're not wearing the masks. We're just not going to do it. If 100,000 of us don't wear masks tomorrow, what are you going to do? Throw 100,000 people in jail for not wearing masks? And, See, and, that's, and that's what happened in Florida. OCL and Orange County came out last week saying you got to wear masks. And the people said, nah, -uh, we're not going to do it. And they backed off. All the teachers say that they can't get students to adhere to school dress codes. They find it hard to believe they're going to be able to get uh, students to wear masks all day. But that does seem like the step that elected officials are taking. And it seems like everyone around the country is looking around uh, as they've done from the beginning. And when one state does something, the next governor kind of looks and says, well, we better go one more or we better do this one more. And I think that's happened in Michigan. The one is the one that is kind of stolen the spotlight as of late because that state has prohibited house to house visits. They've said you can't even go and visit a neighbor. You can't even go congregate with someone or you'll be violating the order. Well, of course, then the question comes up, isn't this politicized? Isn't this about getting an advantage on the Trump administration? Well, of course it is. Now that the great emergency is over for the governors, and I don't mean that it's over, over. I mean, it's over enough that they can get back to being politicians again. You bet they're keeping score and weaponizing this thing. Of course they are. There's an election coming up. I mean, for us to over respond to that and go, oh, what do you, well, what did you think was going to happen? We're all too smart for that. We know that part is a part of reality. How do you crack that code. Here's the way we crack that code. There's one party that's been missing in this. Okay. There's one group that's AWOL, MIA, in this whole debate. The courts are sitting on the sidelines. They know they're going to be busy. The governors have been in, in overkill, to say the least. I mean, they've been way out of control in this. The state lawmakers are the ones that haven't weighed in. Congress weighed in. They did the president's bidding. They did the art of the deal. They got the trillions of dollars in to support the task force and the governors in the states, all right? But it's the state lawmakers. And remember, they're the ones that made these laws in the first place. All these quarantine laws, all these health laws, they were made by the legislature, which means the legislature can now revise them. And in our opinion, they must, but they're not gonna do it unless the people on this call and everybody listening to these programs picks up that phone, calls their state rep and say, you know what, I'm sick of this. Why don't you pass a law that stops it and reopens the state? Now, they're going to give you, well, we got to this, we got to that. We the point is, we're not arguing. We're telling. And that's what they're counting on. The people are saying, we've had enough. We have to have a change. Now, we've prepared a paper that will be available. It's available right now. And it will be available uh, uh, for the next several days that summarizes these ideas very specifically in two brief pages that you can take and share with others about quarantine reform laws. 
it's time for the state legislatures to say open for business and quarantine reform laws. We have to give them more than just open for business. We have to give them the ability to prove to the media that we're actually making changes that are going to help us deal with this thing. And so this is a part of the process, but we've got to get the state legislatures back in the game. And you say, well, our state legislature, uh, I hear the, the, the folks in Florida saying they're out. Well, guess what? It's time for Rick DeSantis to bring them back in. Bring them back in before the election for quarantine reform. Ohio General Assembly, get back in there. Tennessee, you're out of session. Time, Governor Lee, to bring them back. And, and you can call your state rep and say, demand of the governor, demand of the leadership that you be brought back into session so that you can go ahead and pass quarantine reform laws. Now, the governors aren't going to be happy about it because they got all the power right now. But the legislature has to step up. The legislature is not a co-equal branch with the governor. It's not a co-equal branch with the courts. In every case of constitutional law, the legislature is the most powerful of the branches. That's the way the framers saw it. That's the way they talked about it in the Federalist Papers, that it was the vortex of power. They were worried they had made it too powerful. But see, they've surrendered their power. They're not even in this fight. So state reps, and there's an election coming up, and every state rep, Rob Wright, iVoters.com, every member of every state house is up for election, right? Every member of almost every state house, some go in odd number years. Um, Virginia goes in an odd year. But anyway, um, yes, across the country, iVoters.com, when it comes time to vote in uh, September, well, in November, but in September and October, it, you'll enter your address, your zip code, up will pop everyone running from state rep all the way up. Right now, every state is not there. The reason every state is not there right now is every state has different filing deadlines for how candidates reg- file for the ballot. So it's a bit staggered. Um, Ohio is up there now because Ohio has extended their election to April 28th, and it will be a mail-in only election, an extension of absentee voting. That gets to the next question, Dave. Someone's asking regarding the election and your thoughts regarding an only mail-in system. Should that be implemented? Part of the quarantine reform, when we're talking to our state representatives, we need you to protect this upcoming election. Why? <laughs> I hate to tell you this. I can't, we can't, we can never disclose all of our sources because we've learned over 40 years. If you've been granted the grace to do this as, as long as we have as missionaries, you've made a lot of relationships with a lot of people and they weren't trade-off relationships. They had to be built on trust and service. And when you're in a media network like we are, And we have the ability to talk to to lots and lots of people on 200 stations, and and, and we're on stations every single day. These people in high positions don't want to be exposed for things they tell you off the record. So we often can't tell you the sourcing. I can tell you with certainty that we've gotten behind the curtain in enough states and on Capitol Hill to tell you that we know what's going on. They are not ready for the election question because they don't know what the election laws are. Do you? They're not that different from us. Unless you make a living of studying election law, you don't know what the deadlines are for filing, for candidate filings. You don't know what the deadlines are for postings and notices and what's got to go in the newspapers and what the board of elections have to be notified by, how they have to get the envelopes ready, how they have to be printed, what size type style, how the envelope has to be constructed, whether he's got one envelope or two envelope, when it gets mailed out, when it comes back, when the ballot goes out, when it comes back. These are all matters of law. These aren't suggestions. These aren't memos. You're not allowed to miss them. So these take time. So I can tell you with absolute certainty from Secretary of State expertise in this field, they are very nervous that if we don't start making the plans for the November election right now, if there's going to be a substantive change from in-person voting, then we are going to be in big trouble. And friends, I will tell you right now, if we get in big trouble on that November election and people are, are in a position where they're not confident that their votes got counted or the votes are snagged somehow in a legal process because one of those little laws got missed or a timeline got missed, it's a presidential election and some states' electoral votes are going to be held in limbo pending legal appeal, which means we may not be able to elect a president. Well, and that goes to the next question that comes in that asks, is there a provision in the Constitution when it comes to a pandemic or wartime that an election could be missed? Nope. 
period, exclamation mark. No, not ever. And there never has been one missed. And that gives me my favorite line. Forgive me, among all of our friends, you're probably tired of hearing me say this. But people are saying to me all the time, we're doing all this because it's an emergency and we're saving lives. And I say, excuse me. There are millions of people who laid down their lives so that you wouldn't lose your head in an emergency. And you'd keep to the Constitution no matter what. Let's not make light of their sacrifice. We can do three things at the same time. We just have to face the fact that we've brought this mess upon ourselves and shake ourselves out, prioritize again as to what's really important. And this election is very, very important to the fabric of the country. I'm not saying it's anywhere near as important as to who wins or who loses. Don't misunderstand this. For those of you that are listening in the media, this is not a Trump commercial. It's the first time his name maybe has been mentioned. What this is, is the concept that if we lose trust in the electoral process, it doesn't matter who you elect. You're going to have terrible trouble. And that's trouble we don't need to bring on ourselves. What do we do? State legislators. The only people who can fix this are state lawmakers. Now you're all seeing what the other guys have to go through when I'm on the radio, because all I do is talk with my hands. I got to keep one of them off screen at all times. It's dangerous. You can't mess up the election. We messed up one in Ohio. We messed up one in Wisconsin. We can't mess up the general election, which means you got to get a hold of your state lawmakers and say, we need quarantine reform and you need to protect this election. Now, does it mean you could do it all by mail? Uh, Look, we've never done it before. And if we've never done it before, it's dangerous to switch and change now. It's not required that we do it that way, especially if the governors understand that we're fed up with all this stuff. I want to ask you a question. Why can't you go and vote and stay six feet apart like you go to the grocery store? Which is more important, eating today or voting? I take voting. If I can go to the store and do it, why can't I go and vote and do it? And and Dave, when you talk about messing up Ohio's election— Um, what we're referencing is the fact that the governor had the opportunity the week before to call the General Assembly in because the General Assembly in Ohio is who changes the date of the election. So in essence, what happened, they went to court, the judge told them to get lost. So Dr. Acton issued an order that wouldn't be safe to vote the next day. This was 12 hours before election was supposed to start. So we're not saying it should have been held. We're saying it should have been fixed early. And then when that happened, the General Assembly knows they had to fix it. So in essence, we, in Ohio, they had the General Assembly fix Election Day after they extended absentee voting after the Election Day was supposed to be held. And everybody in law knows that sets a dangerous precedent when you allow the General Assembly to do something after the date it was supposed to happen. Behind closed doors, there is no one connected to that debacle that even wants to talk about it. It's so embarrassing. We can't let that happen again. You say, well, come on, we elected these people. We expected so much better from them. Yeah, I get it. Which brings us to the next point. We're going to have to elect some new people. Now, the people listening to this call and to this conference, whatever we call this briefing, okay, and to this radio program are people who care the most about America. But even at that, most of us are scared to death of the idea of running for public office. If you're too scared, find somebody who isn't and support them, mentor them, pray for them, share the public square radio broadcast with them, help them get in the mode of understanding to be effective. See, we have depended upon the parties. It's been convenient. We've built our lifestyles and our businesses, and we've done a really nice job counting on some surrogate agencies to take care of the politics stuff. And guess what? They finally hit the wall. They're out of gas. We've got to reinvent that process. We, the people, have to send constitutionalists that are willing to live sacrificial lives into this process. And we've got to find them. They're out there. They care. Some of them are on this call. Some of them are on listening to this program. And you know who those people are. We've got to recruit them. We've got to support them. Regardless of their party affiliation, that's not the point. It's what do they believe about the Constitution and what are they willing to fight for? Okay, so we've got to bring the state legislature back in. This election is critical. This election has to be defined in many ways as a response to COVID-19. Now, (laughs) that looks like it's going to be pretty easy. The question is, is it going to be confined to people saying, um, oh, we love being shut down and locked down? Or is it going to be, you know, we're not taking this anymore and we're going to find people that are going to give us quarantine reform? What does that look like? Let me give you some quick ideas because we're running out of time here. And Rob, keep looking at some questions. I'll go real quickly and give you five principles that will be on the paper. How's this, Alan? Am I closer right there? Okay. 
All right, five principles on what we need to do in regards to uh, new state quarantine laws. First, primary authority of all quarantine laws has to be in the elected legislature, not the Department of Health. Move it back to the legislature. Two, permit the governor to be the first agent to call for an emergency quarantine, but require that the legislature have approval for the ex, ex for the execution and duration of any quarantine plan. In other words, the governor can say, emergency, emergency, go to the legislature and say, here's our plan, but the legislature must always hold the clock, always, and say, fine, that's a good plan for 14 days. Come back and see us in two weeks. In other words, no blanket quarantine plans. Uh, three, require legislative, uh, uh, four, permit state and local health departments to draft and execute quarantine actions, but only according to established law with mandatory legislative oversight. And five, no person residing in any state, I used Ohio as an example, shall be, uh, shall be subject to quarantine laws without the right of due process and equal protection under the law. No property may be seized, no business closed or access denied without due process of law. And that brings us to the question that a lot of people are asking, I'm going to sue somebody. I, I'm so mad, I'm going to sue somebody. You guys got to sue somebody. I've had people call up and say, I'll give you a bunch of money, go sue somebody. Listen, we've got a great legal team working on this. Right, Rob? Yes, definitely. Right. We've got great legal people working with us, but I'm going to tell you what usually happens. By the time you get a good case in federal court, the crisis is over and everybody loses attention and the case fades away because federal cases are very expensive. What's a federal case cost to actually sustain the whole way to the Supreme Court? Million bucks of, to start. It's got a lot of zeros in it. Million bucks to start. We've got to fix it whether we can get to court or not. Now, if you know a great plaintiff or a group of plaintiffs that's willing to weather this storm and say, I'm willing to fight for the rights that have been robbed from me in, in Tennessee, in Florida, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, wherever you're, you're listening in from right now, we're happy to listen to those plaintiffs. And if a couple of national plaintiffs showed up, I mean, like people like Hobby Lobby, who have been getting bounced around all over the states. If they wanted to show up and get into the game, now we've got a long-term federal case with a solid plaintiff that we could sustain and very likely win with this court. But it takes a very significant commitment. So we can go to court. We've got to change the laws. We've got to change the players in this election so that this never happens to us again. And the fastest way to get everything opened again is not to wait on the White House to call your House member, your Senate member of your state legislature and your governor and say, enough. Dave, some questions coming in regarding China, regarding the relationship with the United States as it moves forward. How will this virus impact that? And should there be sanctions placed or should there be some discussions on what has happened? Yeah, I cut a line from this paper. It was clever, but uh, you know we have to watch the edits. You know, hindsight is always great, but it but it tends to be worthless when you finally discover it, because you got to look forward now. The challenge with China is we've made a boatload of mistakes, and it's cost a lot of good people a boatload of money to learn those mistakes. Okay, now we know better. How about let's get all of our medicine back from China? All of that's got to come back immediately. That's got to be the very, very first thing that happens. Um, I see Trey Gowdy tonight calling for the idea that we should begin to just lop off our debt with China. I think the thing about China we've got to realize is this. One, they're very large. Two, because they're very large, they have a lot of resources. Okay. Uh, they got us population-wise about, what, four to one? But size, isn't, you know, size isn't, always the, uh, always, isn't always the indicator in that kind of global dominance question. They're very large, have a lot of resources, and their philosophy is abundantly clear regarding world domination. They think they've got the better ideas for everybody. The question is, will they act upon that? And are we prepared if China surprises us and decides one day, now that you're down with the virus, how about if we find a way to pull the plug on your internet? Like with 5G? in which case everything we've done tonight disappears. And all of those businesses that have been working for home are gone. What is our relationship with China? 
What are our business relationship with China? How fast can we extract ourselves? It's not an isolationist policy, but it is a protectionist policy. Uh, we've got to protect ourselves from people that are a real threat. And if they've got a worldview domination as part of their philosophy, then you have to protect yourself against that. And to ignore it, we repeat all the lessons that we ignored in the 20th century, which did nothing but get a whole lot of people killed. More questions, Rob. We're, we're really just about out of time. Go, but let's go ahead and see if we can bang off the rest of the questions as fast well, as we can. There was a question that came in from uh, someone that joined us from Wisconsin that said they have experience with recalls in Wisconsin. So could that be an action that some citizens can take in some states to get rid of governors? Yes. And, and each state and each state does that differently, obviously. Different laws, people. but recalls are important. Impeachments are important. Uh, and, and most significantly, because we're at that two-year threshold, how about we get some people to run for governor in some states? You say, well, uh, uh, well, like, like you, you take, well, what if the governors are Republican and an incumbent, and and if you run, you're not going to beat them in a primary? Okay, I get that, and please stick with me. There's a lot of ways to look at this. The importance reality of the election is this: the people in power must come to understand that you cannot mess this up this badly with no accountability. Now, look, you're allowed to make a mistake. Everybody does. We make plenty of them and make up for it. There's a lot of forgiveness in America. But the double down defiance that says, now that all of our models haven't worked, we've got a better idea. Stay home. You're shut down. You're locked down. And now wear a mask. In other words, it's going the wrong direction. They are turning us into the enemies of the state. And they're turning us against each other. And as we ask them questions for those candidates that want to run in the future, will this be the opportunity for us to ask them questions almost as a litmus test, if you will, their stance regarding lockdowns, their stance regarding quarantines that past administrations had put into place? Where do you fall on that? I think those are simple constitutional questions to you ask give future them, candidates. Uh, give them a copy of the paper that we're posting right now. And in fact, Anne, I got and number five, I've got no person residing in Ohio shall be subject to quarantine laws. I was working in this out for an actual media release in Ohio at the time. Uh, let's put no person residing in any state shall be subject to quarantine. This paper can be shared with any state lawmakers and, and said, can you introduce legislation that will represent these principles? And, and just keep asking because they can and they will. They always try to kind of, well, you don't understand. And there's a debit. No, no, you're right. I don't understand. How about we just do it? OK, we're not stupid. We get this stuff. They always think that we're stupid. And I don't blame them because most people aren't paying attention. But this is different. When you see the sheet, you'll know. Go ahead, Robbie. Another question. Uh, if Dr. Acton's orders are unconstitutional, what she's doing, could a suit be filed tomorrow and would it have an impact? Yes, the suit could be filed tomorrow. We have lawyers waiting to file that suit, but we have to have a plaintiff that is uh, significant enough in their infraction that they can merit a strong federal claim that will net us a real gain. It'll take two years. And when we win it, we really want to have won something substantive. So we have to analyze the claim and then we have to analyze whether or not we have the resources for that two years. But we have the lawyers that are willing to do it. And, and they're coming from a, a nonprofit community. So they have to get paid, but they're not trying to get rich. Okay. But it does take um, uh, we've got to get plaintiffs. We need a bunch of plaintiffs. We need a lot, bunch of really good plaintiffs as fast as we can get them. A uh, question regarding studies and the fact that so many of the studies are being, it, it appears the models are being funded by Bill Gates and yep. Dr. Bricks being on the board of Bill yep. Gates. Is there a major conflict of interest when you have Bill Gates funding models, you have them funding vaccine studies, and then you have Oh, and he's funding some something else. He's funding a cooperative effort with Apple to do contact tracing. And if this doesn't scare you, I'm sorry. You're going to have to say extra prayers tonight before bedtime because this is what's keeping me up at night. Between Apple and Google, they've combined these circle technology companies. These are the guys who've been real quiet, but they've been real busy. They now are putting together. Can you imagine they're going to join platforms between Android and Apple phones? Can you imagine these two competitors coming together to offer a technological solution on COVID? And here's the way the solution works. We all go to a grocery store. All right. Everybody in this call is in a very large store. Well, it'd have to be in a couple of stores. There's a pretty good amount of people on this on this uh, briefing night. OK, so we're all in a store together and you're in aisle 12 and I'm in aisle 20. All right. But we get within 10 feet of each other and our phones share through Bluetooth and we it notes everyone that I come within 10 feet of. 
through Bluetooth. Because you know you can do that Bluetooth sharing stuff, right? You can share photos. You can you can do the bump and share an address. Well, it bumps and automatically shares the contact information of who was around. Then let's just say that of the 500 people that I was around in that store, one of them tests positive for COVID-19, and I was within 10 feet of that person. Then suddenly my phone informs me that I have been in next to a person who has tested positive, and I should go into a 14-day quarantine. And then since governors around the country love to watch cell phone data, they're going to make sure that their Department of Health are monitoring these as well. And the next thing you know, there's a quarantine officer on your front door saying it's been noted through your cell tone activity that you have been exposed to COVID-19. So you must go into a mandatory 14 day lockdown to make sure that you don't get the, the, the disease. That's what Bill Gates is busy working on. And I got to tell you something right now that ought to scare us to pieces because there are false positives, there are all false negatives, but the idea of actually having that much data about your life and your personhood controlled by these circle companies and what they can do with that stuff and what law enforcement can do with that stuff, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Now, I wanna make sure that we say this because there've been so many people get scared out of their mind. This isn't child's play. We're not making light of a serious disease, a disease that causes death to a lot of people. And I don't buy the fact that it's 98% that don't get sick and die. That's true. But 2% is still 2%. Those are human beings, every single life. We do not minimize one loss of life. We get that. No amount of people dying is expendable. We need to work for a, key, a cure at every single level. But we have to understand what we're dealing with here. Life is surrounded with opportunities for living and opportunities for dying. And to cede control to the government to tell you that you're going to be quarantined because you have now entered into a potential risk situation without your consent is wrong. Now, if this was Ebola and people were dying in 24 to 48 hours after contact, there'd be a whole different conversation going on here. But let's go back to Johns Hopkins University, their chief virologist online to this very hour, four times in four minutes, telling us this disease for the vast majority of people is a mild disease with mild symptoms. What we've had is a terrible scare that's turning into a scar. And if that scar gets much deeper and much bigger, we're going to lose trust in our country. And if we lose trust in our country and trust in each other and trust in our ability to do the right thing, then in that case, there is no doubt that the cure was far worse than the disease. Rob, well, any closing remarks or questions? You no, know, we had one question that um, I can hit on. They were asking about the change CDC regulations or guidelines when it comes to test reporting. Uh, they want now that if someone has two things, it's uh, chills, fever, body aches, you have two of those, or if you have one of um, coughing, I believe it's tightness of chest or difficulty breathing, then those will be marked probable. And I think where you run into a problem with that is the fact that when you look at, you can look at any state. I know um, the state of Ohio has tested roughly 70,000 people. They talk, talk about there being a lack of tests available, but those 70,000 people are the ones being tested that are on the front lines or that have the most symptoms. And they're only testing positive at a 10% rate. That's the test number that they're testing positive. So we're running into a little bit of a dangerous precedent where we're going to say, all right, we're going to lump all these people as being testing positive when they have symptoms and they may not have COVID-19. So it's a little manipulation of data that possibly could be happening. And historically, in every epidemic, it's difficult to get actual numbers until it's all over. And there's always the question of forensic editing. How were the records changed? Because one thing looked like something it wasn't. But see, usually the, the models are built after the fact to give us advice for what's going to happen the next time. This is a very rare occasion where we built so many projective models that were all over the place. And then they not just informed public policy decision making, they drove, you know, the science drove everything. There's a subtle spiritual undertone in all of this as well. Maybe it's not so subtle. We want to be in control. And we've been raised to believe we're cosmic accidents, that we're alone in the universe, there is no God, and that you know we're just basically a cosmic accident. And our goal in life is to bend the curve upwards of in a progressive way of always being 
the primal species, always being the ones that are overcoming, right? The line of progression of Darwinism, that we're Darwinian, Darwinianism, that the evolutionary line is always bending upward. And something like this comes along and we're not in control. And so rather than saying, God help us, we say, trust the science. Look, the people that made those models have told us, or that have been using those models have told us over and over again, the models are only as good as the suppositions that you put into those models and the data that you put in. There is a much more reliable source that from which we can gain encouragement and strength and hope. God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in time of trouble. And he has always been there for us. See, it's impossible, I think, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and not try to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think it's equally impossible to try to love your neighbor as you love yourself in your own strength. And loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is what we're being called to do. So we need God's help. We can overcome this thing, but we're not going to get there by panic. And we're certainly not going to get there by treating everybody like they're a middle schooler, or in some cases, a kindergartner. And just for the record, I know how frustrated everybody is. You should know. We try to present out on the public square a nice balanced approach, uh, a biblical con context, historical realities, legal, good legal research, good science, and we bring in experts from all over the place. I am tired of being talked to like a middle schooler. I am tired of being told to don my cape and mask. All right. You know, because when I was a kid in kindergarten, I tried all that stuff. And then they had to explain to me, you can't jump off the roof and fly. Okay. I don't have the ability to defy gravity. And science doesn't have the ability to ultimately beat this thing. We can overcome it. But when we do, there'll be another virus and we'll have to overcome that one. That's the life that we live in in a fallen world. And we can do that, but it's very difficult to do it if you stop trusting each other. And the reason our constitution exists and our laws exist is they're built upon the consent of the governed. That means that when we started this thing, we were all in it together. But you have to trust each other to get there. D Dave, last question for tonight. Sure. Someone, well, a couple people have written in. Are we going to do this again? Well, that's kind of you. We sure hope so. Uh, and I've had a couple of questions coming in saying um, uh, things like, how is your funding surviving through the midst of all this? I know the people that are that are tuning in right now and are listening in right now are the ones that are praying for us and sticking with us. And I appreciate every single person. It's a very awkward position to be in, to be a nonprofit in a nonpartisan organization in a world where everybody's taking sides and throwing stuff at each other. But that's our job. And we signed up for it. And that's what we do. But we can't do that if people don't support us. And I want to thank everybody taking the time to join us tonight. Everybody who prays for us, everybody who passes this information along to someone else. The what to do list you'll see posted at aproundtable.org. This broadcast will become a part of the public square. Uh, uh, COVID Chronicles as well, probably number nine. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. I, I can't even ask people for their help in times like this because I know how freaked out they are. But you know the need is real. And I know you know because every day somebody's trying to meet it. And I just want to say we're all very thankful. We're very, very grateful. Without your help, we wouldn't be able to do this. Now, if we get to that American Mission Center, which is the goal yet this year, we could have actually done this and been six feet away from each other in one building and had all the technology. You don't want to know what we went through and what's going on behind the scenes. It will get easier, hopefully. But in the meantime, we're just going to keep fighting together. So I don't know, Rob, how do we say see you later? Well, uh, again, those there may be some watching that are new to us, so I would encourage them to visit us at aproundtable.org or thepublicsquare.com. If you're not on our email list, that's a great way to get on our list, our monthly update list. We'll provide you all the information you need, and then you'll be up to date on what we're releasing as far as radio distribution across the country, but also for when we do another one of these briefings. Thanks to Alan C. Duncan for helping us out tonight and all the wonderful staff at Roundtable that works as missionaries to America. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone who joined us tonight. Thank you. And good night. Good night.